Hello and welcome to another limited set review for Outlaws of Thunder Junction. I'm Paul Chion, and today we are going to be reviewing the color black. Now, before we get into this video, if you've enjoyed this content and wanted to support this channel in another way, I started a Patreon channel. The link is in the description below. Shout out to all the current patrons. I thank you so much for your support. A lot of activity in the Patreon Discord right now as we evaluate all the cards and get really excited over Outlaws of Thunder Junction. Um, previewed a couple colors already and already just looking forward to something new and trying out the new set. Now, before we head into the evaluation, I do twi just quickly want to rehash my overall evaluations and grades for the upcoming cards. I'm gonna be rating things on a grading scale from A through F. Uh, mostly gonna to try to keep it those letters, the occasional high pluses and minuses here and there, but just gonna be going to look to use mostly an A through F scale. So A's, what's an A? A's are bombs. A's are cards that you're happy to first pick, you slam them, and there are even cards that you consider switching colors for, at least in pack two, because of the power level of the cards. They will significantly increase your win rate if you draft these cards. Examples of bombs are Aurelia's Vindicator, Izoni, and Cryptic Coat from Murders at Karlov Manor. Moving on, we have B. Those are good cards. If you're these colors, you are never not playing these cards. You are always playing cards. Uh, if these cards are in your color, these are cards that you will often first pick. And most of the time, these cards are going to be uncommons and rares with the very, very rare common. Good examples of bees are Torch the Witness, Neighborhood Guardian, and A Killer Among Us. Then we have the C's. These are the meat and potatoes of your deck. These are all the solid cards. These are the cards that are often going to make your deck, I would say, 90% of the time. You're rare rarely going to cut cards that are C-level cards, unless your deck is completely busted and filled with all the Bs and As. Moving on, we have D cards. These are filler cards, often picks cards number 20 to 23 of your draft decks or seal, or seal decks. These are cards you're not super happy with playing, but oftentimes you will find a reason to put them in your deck. They'll have some kind of a role, or they work well with your deck, or look, sometimes you just need a five mana five five to put into your deck. Examples of filler cards are Suspicious Detonation, Griffnot Tracker, and Shady Informant. Then we have Fs. Now, Fs are not that commonly handed out. These are often weird build around rares or mythics that really have no application in Limited. Uh, just generally don't play cards in this tier. You will lose significantly more games if you have this card in your deck than if you do. Cards like Slime Against Humanity, Magnifying Glass, Behind the Mask, Cards of that nature are cards that you definitely generally don't want to be playing in your deck. Now, we've already spent the first two uh, set reviews going over some of the mechanics. So this time I'm going to be really fast going through them. We have your saddle mechanic, which is basically a new variation on crew, except you can only do it at sorcery speed and on your turn. All saddles or mounts rather come on creatures and when you do saddle them, you do get a bonus ability when you saddle them with your creatures. For example, the trained Erinx is a 2 mana 3-1. If you saddle when you attack, it gets first strike and you get to scry 1. So nice little bonuses and again, they are all offensively oriented because you can't saddle creatures on defense. Moving on, we have plot. This is a keyword where instead of casting a card now, you can pay mana at sorcery speed to plot a card that you can cast at a later turn. So let's say you play a uh, plot card here, you pay four mana for a plot card. At any turn outside of the turn that you cast the plot card, you can then cast that spell. Everything is gonna be at sorcery speed. Additionally with plot, unlike foretell where the card is hidden, your opponents can actually see what you've plotted, so they know that you're up to something, and they can also plan accordingly, given the fact that you do have a card that is plotted. Then there's Crime. Anytime you target your opponent, or you target one of their spells, or you target one of their creatures, any way, any, basically any game action that you take that interacts with your opponent in some way will trigger Crime. The Crime at that point has already been committed. There's no way to counter that. And so if you have a card that triggers off of committing a Crime, then you will get that trigger from that creature. But finally, we have Spree. Spree is an effect. It's kind of um, like entwined. It's just a modal effect. Every Spree card will have a casting cost and then different, card, different abilities that you can cast depending on how much mana that you spend. So oftentimes these Spree cards will have two or three modes on them and you can actually spend all the different mana costs 
associated with all the different spells on the card itself to cast multiple spells in one turn if you want. For example, let's say you have uh, a spell that acts as a counter spell. It, it costs a blue and one in a blue to cast a counter spell, one in a blue to draw two cards, one in a blue to bounce a permanent. If you play three colorless and three blue along with the blue, you can play seven mana, pay seven mana rather, to get to get all three effects. So you, you can kind of mix and match depending on kind of what you want. So those are the mechanics. Now let's move into the black cards in this format. All right, starting things off here, we have the Ambush Gigapede. Six mana for a 6-2 flash creature that is an insect. It's got flash. When Ambush Gigapede enters a battlefield, target creature and opponent controls gets minus two, minus two until end of turn. So it's very expensive. Six mana is generally just not where you want to be playing magic cards in this day and age. So this is not something I'm too uh, excited to play. You can get a two for one in a lot of instances here if they attack you with a big thing and then have a two toughness creature in play. You can play this and kill their two two and eat their big thing. But at the same time, this is just a pretty poor body for six mana, a two toughness creature. Like your opponent can shock this and you're not getting a whole lot of value out of this. So I'm going to give this a D. Now, there is that blue common that makes things cheaper to cast on your opponent's turn. So I, I suppose if you can like play this for five mana, that's when it gets a little bit better. But yeah, not too happy with Ambush Gigapede. It just costs way too much mana. Moving on, we have Binding Negotiation. This is one in a black. Target opponent, sorcery. Target opponent reveals their hand. You may choose a long land card from it. If you do, they discard it. Otherwise, you may put a face-up exiled card they own into their graveyard. So it can do one of two things, right? Number one, you can choose to just make them discard any non-land card from their hand for two mana. That's fine. I'm generally not a huge fan of hand disruption and limited, mostly because games can go long. And when you draw this in the late game, it does absolutely nothing. But this has a little extra flexibility in the fact that you can also use it to um, remove plot cards. If your opponent plots a card, you can cast this binding negotiation to basically remove plotted cards. So that gives this deck, this card rather an added level of flexibility. But in general, I am not the biggest fan of hand disruption, so I'm just not going to be interested in this card that much. I'm going to give Binding Negotiation a D. If you want to give it a high D, sure, but I'm going to give it a D. Moving on, we have Black Snack, Black, Black Snag Buzzard. Two and a black for a 2-1 flyer. Black Snack Buzzard enters the battlefield with a plus one, plus one counter on it if a creature died this turn. Plot one in a black. So... Three mana for a 2-1 flyer is not especially good. You can play this turn two, I suppose, and then play a turn three as a 2-1. And the fact that it does have a plot cost of two means you can kind of double spell, which can interact with some payoff cards that you can have. But all in all, I think just the body on this is, is fairly weak. And also, if you plot it, it kind of makes it kind of obvious, right? You're not really going to be able to get a plus one, plus one counter that often unless you don't put this into play at a later point in the game. But if you're plotting this turn two, then you didn't play a two drop. So that all matters, right? We're not in a world where you just like can get away with plotting a card on turn two, having your opponent play a two drop, and then you just not playing this card and then just getting kind of run over. So oftentimes, I think if you plot this on turn two, you're probably going to have to play in turn three anyways as a 2-1 flyer, but it's delayed. So it's not the same as a two mana 2-1 two flyer because you can't attack the turn that you, it comes into play. So I'm going to give this a C. I don't think it's that exciting, but there are instances like if you can get a plus one, plus one counter on this card, of course, then the card becomes pretty solid. Moving on, we have Blood Hustler. One and a black for a 1-1 one, one Vampire Rogue. Whenever you commit a crime, put a plus one, plus one counter on Blood Hustler. This ability triggers only once each turn. Three and a black, target opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So the nice thing about this card is, is that it has a built-in engine to commit crime. Now it costs four mana, but let's say you have a bunch of cards that get benefits from you committing a crime, all of a sudden you have a guaranteed way to commit a crime that doesn't cost you a card. So there's something there. I mean, it's a bit of a mana sink too. So every now and then you can get them. But of course, paying four mana to drain your opponent for one and put a plus one, plus one counter on a two mana one one is not the strongest thing. What you want to do with this card is play a variety of cards that allow you to commit a crime for relatively low cost. We're looking at, you know, the one mana blue flyer, that's a 1-1 one, one, that enters a battlefield and taps something. Or the one mana blue spell that um, 
targets a creature and cantrips, right? Those are the cards that you're kind of looking for to make this card really work. But the thing is, this creature does start out as a two mana one one, but it does have the potential to get out of hand pretty quickly. And depending on the deck, I think this card can be end up being very good. I'm gonna give this a C to start with, but I can definitely see decks where this moves up into the B tier if you can find a reliable way to commit a crime every single turn. And I could be far off on this. This could be like the Quirion Dryad of the format where you play it and every turn you're able to just put a counter on it while playing spells. If you can manage to do that, then I think this card is good. But I just don't know that every creature that you play, like you play this turn two, let's say you just play a random creature on turn three and you didn't commit a crime, then this is still a two mana one one that's on the battlefield. So I try to look at, obviously the ceiling is very high for this, but I also try to think about like normal games of magic that can be played. And let's say you have the Black Snack Buzzard, you play this Hustler on two, you play the Buzzard on three, I mean, excuse me, that's the next card. You play the Buzzard on three, it just didn't get bigger, right? That's why I'm going to give it a C, but I see the ceiling for this card being B level. Next, we have Boneyard Desecrator. Three and a black for a 3-4 menace creature. One and a black, sack another creature, put a plus one, plus one counter on Boneyard Desecrator. If an outlaw was sacrificed this way, create a treasure token. So this is a nice way to have as a sacrifice outlet. I believe there was a white common. It's one of the last white commons that we... Um, that we previewed, it was two and a white for a three, three. Whenever a creature you control dies, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. So these those two cards go really well together. That being said, uh, the body on this isn't really great. It is a four mana, three, four menace. It's okay. Um, but, and if you're playing kind of a sacrifice strategy, I think this card can be decent. I'm gonna... I'm going to say that you're going to be able to maybe make treasure as well some of the time. I'm not looking to take this card that highly. So I'm going to put this in the D tier, but a high D. Like, I think you can put this. And then if you have, like, the right deck around this, this can be kind of a build around C, where if you do have, you know, a lot of ways to generate tokens or what have you and things that trigger off of things dying, for example, a black-white deck, um, then I can see this going up in value a little bit. Um, but I'm going to have it kind of in the high D, so... Black not starting off great, I'm just going to say. Excuse me, did I have Blood Hustler at... Yeah, I had it at C. Anyways, moving on, we have Caustic Bronco here. One in the black for a 2-2. Two -two. All right, it's a bear. Snake Horse Mount. They ran out of words for extra keywords. Uh, whenever Caustic Bronco attacks, reveal the top card of your library and put it into your hand. You lose life equal to that card's mana value if Caustic Bronco isn't saddled. Otherwise, each opponent loses that much life. It's got a saddle cost of three. So, it's a two mana two two. If you do not saddle this card, it basically lets you Dark Confidant every turn, right? You get to reveal the top card and put a card into your hand. So it draws you a card and then you lose life equal to the converted mana cost. Now, if you play cards like this, you generally want to keep your mana curve kind of low. However, you can saddle this card. And that's what makes this card awesome. Because when you... if I mean, it's night and day, the difference. If you can saddle this, it gets completely absurd. Because now you play this, you saddle it, you reveal a 5-drop, they take 5? Like, that's insane, right? The thing is, you're not even really necessarily expecting to... Um, you're not necessarily expecting this creature to live necessarily, but if you play a turn two, like if you play this turn two on the play and your opponent plays their turn two on the play, like if you just play a three drop with three power, you saddle it and you attack, you hit something, they take two and then you draw another card This replaces itself. That seems awesome. And don't, don't get me started if you can draw multiple cards with this card. So as a two drop, I think this gives you like a good amount of value. It's always going to draw you a card if you really want it to. I'm going to give this card a B. I think Caustic Bronco is a very, very solid two drop. Moving on, we have Consuming Ashes. Two, black, black, instant. Exile target creature. If it had mana value three or less, surveil two. All right. So this is the premium black removal spell of this format. But with a little bit of a twist, there's a couple of really important lines of text in this card. Number one. Exile target creature. That is big. That is big. Because one of the premier combat tricks... Actually, I can 
look it up right here. One of the premier combat tricks in white is take up the shield, right? It's take up the shield, which is one in a white target creature gets plus one, plus one counter and indestructible. And if this said destroy target creature, then it would counter that spell. But because this exiles, you do not have to worry about this spell. And that makes it better because now all of a sudden their two mana combat trick can't trade up on mana. Later on, you're going to see other combat tricks as well, which is like, if this creature were to die, return it to the battlefield. Well, if you exile, you don't have to worry about that. So this card actually does get to counteract some of the counter uh, combat tricks in the format, which makes this card a little bit better in this format. So I think that was a really, it's a very small thing, but it's extremely relevant to the context of limited, especially. Additionally, four mana, kill anything at instant speed. It's a fine card. It's like a C level card. It's fine. But the fact that it exiles and also the fact that when you trade down on mana, you get a benefit out of this. That's really important. Because when you're consuming ashes and you kill a three drop, you're kind of down on the exchange there. But when you're killing a three drop or less and you get to surveil two, surveil two is like what? What would you rate surveil two? Like two thirds of a card, right? Like 40% of a card, maybe 50% of a card. I don't know. It's at least like half a card, right? It gives you a good amount of value. So for that reason, I mean, I would I would guess that this is probably going to be ending up, end up being one of the better um, removal spells in the format. And so I think I'm going to give this a low B. Could be a little bit off. It's, it's double black. But I think there's enough adjustments to this card with the exile and the surveil too for the, low, uh, for the cheaper things where I think... Um, this card will be a little better than you think, especially if the format ends up being a little bit slower. Also, I think we need to recalibrate our thoughts on removal after Murders at Karlov Manor. And Mur in Murders at, Kar at Karlov Ma Manor, all removal was worse than in a normal set because half the creatures that you played had Ward 2, right? So all your removal spells just cost more. So Murder was a five mana removal spell in a lot of instances. You couldn't just kill their three drop on turn three. That's not the case here, right? You no longer have that as a drawback. So I do think removal gets a little bit better because that's no longer a thing. So we need to just recalibrate our brain just a little bit and be like, oh, I don't want to take this removal spell. But I do like the fact that it has surveil too. Um, so I'm going to have this at low B, high C, somewhere along that range. Moving on, we have Corrupted Conviction. One black for an instant. As an additional cost to cast the spell, sacrifice a creature draw two cards so i've never i don't know i've never really been a fan of cards like this i think there is a place where this could have a home it's like a deck that can generate tokens that's looking to sacrifice a bunch of things and in that instance you can play this but i really just don't like playing that many cards that don't affect the board or combat in any way if i draw cards i don't want there to be a qualifier for that as well i'm giving corrupt the conviction of d until proven otherwise. I do think it may be in Black White Sacrifice. You can play this as a one of, but even then, like I'd rather just play that four mana, three, four menace creature because it's still something you play that in the late game you can still use to sacrifice. Next, we have Desert's Dew. One in a black instant. Target creature gets minus two, minus two until end of turn. It gets an additional minus one, minus one until end of turn for each desert you control. So I don't know how easy it is for you to get deserts in your deck. I'm going to assume that roughly you're going to have maybe one, maybe two deserts in your deck at most. That's going to be my assumption. And cards like this will definitely make you play off-color deserts potentially to get the benefit. Like let's say your deck has three deserts dues in it. Then you are more likely to, let's say you're blue-black and you see a black-white desert. You're probably going to play that black-white desert because it commits a crime, and also it makes it so that deserts do goes from being minus two, minus two, to minus three, minus three, and that's a big deal. That's a really big deal because if you just look at this as one in a black target creature gets minus two, minus two, it's fine. It's nothing that special, but once you get it to the minus three, minus three range, I'm never anticipating this to be minus four, minus four, by the way, if you can get it to minus three, minus three on a consistent basis, then of course it goes up in value. So I'm going to start this out at C, noting that if you do have a bunch of deserts, you can maybe get it up to a C plus. Next, we have Desperate Bloodseeker. One in a black for a 2-2 two -two lifelinking vampire. I like that. Like you literally 
Say No More. I'll play that card in my deck. With the general speed of uh, speed of uh, formats in recent sets, I am always playing that card. I mean, I'm playing that in just about any deck anyways. But additionally, when Desperate Bloodseeker enters the battlefield, target player mills two cards. So the really important thing about that, I mean, there's two things. If there's any graveyard synergy stuff whatsoever, you can mill yourself, obviously, and then you can find ways to return things from your graveyard. Number two, it is a completely awesome playable card by itself that allows you to commit a crime. So this is exactly the type of card that I'm looking for. If I want just a solid creature that I can also use to commit a crime and there's no cost whatsoever. It's not like I'm getting a 1-2 lifelinker, right? So let's say I play, you know, the three mana 1-4 vigilance creature. It gets plus two, plus zero when I commit a crime. Turn four, I just play Desperate Bloodseeker and I, I play a solid creature and then I still hit them for three. That's exactly the kind of card that I want. It's a solid, solid two with lifelink, commits a crime, everything I want. Uh, 100%, this is going to be one of my top five black commons in the set. Next up, fake your own death. One in a black for an instant. Until end of turn, target creature gets plus two, plus zero, and gains. When this creature dies, return it to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control, and you create a treasure token. So it's a combat trick. It pumps your creatures just a little bit, and it gives you a little bit extra, right? It gives you that that treasure token. So, you know, it's in fact, sometimes you can almost say it costs you one mana, although it really doesn't, uh, but it does give you that mana. Um, but, you know, this, by the way, is the precise type of card that cannot play around the um, Consuming Ashes right? Because Consuming Ashes exiles creatures, so Fake Your Own Death does not work against that. So you have to be really careful when you're trying to use a combat trick like this. I think this card's going to be just okay. It's probably just going to be a D for me. I'll play it if I absolutely need a combat trick, but I'm not going to value it too highly. Again, I generally start lower on combat tricks, uh, and I might be punished for doing so, but we'll see. Next, we have Forsaken Miner. One black for a 2-2. That's a heavy hitter. Skeleton Rogue. Forsaken Miner can't block. Whenever you commit a crime, you may pay a black. If you do, return Forsaken Miner from your graveyard to the battlefield. So, this is certainly going to be... If there's an aggressive black deck and constructed, I can see you playing this. The big thing with this card is it just can't block, right? So, you have to be aggressive. But if you're aggressive, this card's really annoying to deal with, right? If you play the... If you just have an opener where this is... You're on the play and you have a Forsaken Miner and you're just playing like a Rakdos aggro deck or something like that. I don't even know if Rakdos is the aggro color combo. We'll get to red next. Uh, this is just really, really annoying threat to deal with just because I feel like committing a crime is fairly is going to be fairly trivial. And because of that, you're just going to be able to get this back and they're just going to have, you're just going to have a, this cheap threat that's a 2-2. That's a thing too. A lot of cards like this in the past have been 2-1s, right? It's classic... Black 2-1, creature can't block, and then some way to get it back into play, right? And the reason why it's so important is because there are a lot of ways to make 1-1 tokens in this format, and the fact that this can actually eat through that is a pretty big deal. So I think if you're an aggressive deck, this card can be a C. Um, and if you're not aggressive at all, don't put this in your deck. Moving on. All right. Got some power here. Gissa the Hellraiser. Three black black for a 4-4 four, four, ward, two colorless, pay two life. So if you want to kill this, you got to pay two and two life to get this off the battlefield. Skeletons and zombies you control get plus one, plus one, and have menace. That's a really big buff. If you can find a way to get skeletons and zombies into play. Well, guess what? Gissa allows you to do that. Whenever you commit a crime, create Two tapped two two blue and black zombie rogue creature tokens. This ability triggers only once each turn. What does that mean? This is a five mana four four ward two pay two life. If on that same turn somehow you can find a way to commit a crime, let's say with a creature in play or what have you, you get two three three tapped zombie tokens that are that have menace. That's insane. Thinking about the stats that you're getting there. Again, for 5 mana, you're getting 10 power and 10 toughness worth of stats. With 6 power and 6 toughness of those cards being having menace. 
This card is absolutely bananas. Obviously, like generally, you want to try to find a way to play this and trigger it right away. Uh, sometimes it's going to be pretty difficult because this costs five mana. But if you can, the payoff is super worth it. This card is a slam dunk bomb. A for Gissa. Next up, we have a Hollow Marauder. Six and a black for a 4-2 Flying Spectre Rogue. This spell costs one less to cast for each creature card in your graveyard. When Hollow Marauder enters the battlefield, any number of target opponents each discard a card. So you target them, so you're committing a crime. And for each of those opponents who didn't discard a card with mana value four or greater, draw a card. So what does this mean? Well, this means that if they discard something small, because that's usually what you want to do for discard effects, you get to draw a card. They need to discard a relevant threat out of their hand or uh, in order for you to not draw a card. So this card is, if you can resolve it, it gives you a lot of value. But the problem here, of course, it's in the top left corner. It's six and a black to cast. Now, there is a cost reduction element to this, and we saw that common earlier, which was the one in a black for a 2 2 life linker, ETB mill yourself for two. So, if you have a lot of ways to mill yourself, sacrifice some creatures, if you can get Hollow Marauder to four mana, right? If you can get a Hollow Marauder to four mana, I think this card is very solid. Four mana for a 4 2 flyer that makes your opponent discard a very relevant threat. They have to discard a card no matter what. If they discard something small, you draw a card. So if I feel like I have a lot of self-mill, I'm going to play this. Now, if you think that this card, on average, you're going to be able to play for six mana or five mana, that's when I don't think this card is particularly strong just because the body is, is a little bit weak. Like five mana for a 4-2 flyer with this effect is just okay. Four mana is good. Six mana is pretty bad. If you have to pay full price, which will almost never happen because creature combat occurs... But I think just if you don't have any ways to self-mill, I think the natural casting cost for this will often be five. I think it's going to be pretty hard to pull off at four unless you go, no, you're just not going to be able to do it for four. Five. I think I think on average it's going to be five unless you have some self-mill. So if you have some self-mill, I think this can be like a high C. And then in most decks, this probably kind of Touches in that low C category for me. I'm not looking to take this too highly unless I already have some, some mill stuff going on. Next up, we have Insatiable Avarice. This is a spree sorcery, one black. Plus two, search your library for a card, then shuffle and put that card on top. Plus black black, so plus two black. Target player draws three cards and loses three life. So... I think the better ability here is the drawing three cards and drawing, losing three life part, but you have to pay black, black, black to draw three and discard three. That's just not good. That's just not a great rate. That's just, that's a D level card to me. I'm just not putting that card in my deck. And then black for two plus two mana, search for library for a card, then shuffle and put that card on top. Like you're down a card on that exchange. So I don't want that card either. So where does that put Insatiable Avarice? A card you shouldn't play in your deck in general, unless you're maybe mono black with a bomb. I'm going to give this card a D. It might be an F, but this is definitely not something you take early. Again, this is not a demonic tutor effect. This puts the card on top. You are down a card. Unless you pay six mana. What happens when you pay six mana? You lose three life, you draw three cards, and then you draw the card, I guess, that you tutor for on top. But that's just too much of a cost for six mana. I think this is just... Overcosted by a slight amount. I think if it was plus one colorless, it could be more of a consideration. But with the mana costs on this card, it's not something I want to play. Moving on, we have a legendary creature, Kervik, the Punisher. One and two black for a 3-3 human warlock. When you commit a crime, exile up to one target black card from your graveyard and copy it. You may cast the copy. If you do, lose two life. So, you obviously need to fulfill a few conditions, okay? Number one is you need to have a black card in your graveyard. If you obviously have some self-mill things, that definitely helps, which also makes me raise the stock of that 2-mana two 2-2 two -two lifelink common even more. I mean, obviously, this is a rare, so it doesn't happen that often, but just there seems to be a lot of incidental ways that you get value out of for milling yourself. If you looked at some of the blue cards as well in this format... There were a couple of cards that were quite strong that cast 
spells from your graveyard, right? So I think self-milling yourself is actually a real thing and something that you want to do. Once you meet this condition, committing a crime isn't too difficult. Uh, ideally, you want to commit a crime that's cheap or free because if you do, because for this card in particular, you still need to cast the card. So you need to have enough mana here to cast to commit a crime and then play the spell from your graveyard. This works really, really well, obviously, with... Actually, it works well with anything, right? If you just have literally a black card in your graveyard. Remember, this doesn't just target any spell. If you have a two-mana, two-two black creature in your graveyard, right? And then let's say, like, turn four, you just use the two-mana black removal spell to kill something, you can exile the two-two from your graveyard, lose two life, and put some extra thing into play, and that gives you some value. Now, like I said, so there, there are some conditions that you have to meet to make this card be good. It's one and two black, so it's a little bit harder to cast, but I think it's pretty solid. I'm going to give Kevrick the Punisher a B. Moving on, we have Lively Dirge. One and a black for a sorcery. This is a spree card. Plus one colorless mana. Search your library for a card. Put it into your graveyard, then shuffle. I like to have how they have um, like an Imperial Seal and an Entomb in this format. Uh, plus two colorless. Return up to two creature cards with total mana value four or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. So the, the joke with this card is you want to basically spree and pay both parts of this, right? Like one black plus one, like paying three mana to put a creature card in your graveyard is just not something that you really want to do in this in limited in general, unless you have like a reanimation spell plus an absurd bomb, like a Gissa or something. But um, if you pay five mana, what you can do is put a cheap creature into your graveyard. And then if you have another cheap card in your graveyard, you can return up to two things with total mana value. So not for each, the combined mana value of the two creatures you put into play. So likely two, two drops, maybe a three and a one. You can put those two onto the battlefield um, to get a little bit of value. But because of the fact that you're returning creatures with a total mana value of four or less, you're not getting a ton of value with regards to mana efficiency, right? Because you're paying five mana for this effect, but you are potentially getting an extra card. But because you're not getting a, a giant thing into play, I wish you could get something big. I don't think this card is very good. I'm going to give Lively Dirge a D. Next, we have Mourner Surprise. One in a black for a sorcery. Return up to one target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. Create a 1-1 one, one red mercenary creature token with tap target creature you control gets plus one plus zero until end of turn. Activate only as a sorcery. So I like this card. So this is basically a gravedigger, right? It's two mana. It's a raise that effect, but... It's a raise that effect with a body attached to it. And that's really important because when you already play a raise that effect, you're not down a card, but of course you lose some tempo because you have to pay mana to get something back. But this gives you a body. And from what I've learned, just playing whatever, 25 years of magic, whenever you have these abilities and it tacks on just that little extra thing, and I've talked about life gain in the past, but in this case, it's a creature, like a token, like, that matters. That matters a lot. And so I think this card is very, very solid. And don't look at this as just to raise that effect because it comes with that body. I'm going to give this a C. I like this card a lot, especially because Black is also looking to do some light self-milling stuff as well. So you're going to have cards in your graveyard. So I do like this card. Now, also remember, you can cast this card like in a pinch, like in a, let's say you have no creatures and you really need a 1-1. You can still play this and get a 1-1. You don't have to return a creature, but of course you want to get the value from that. Neutralize the guards. Two and a black for an instant. Creature's target opponent controls gets minus one and minus one until end of turn, surveil two. This is definitely one of those like high ceiling, high floor type cards where there are instances where this card will do almost nothing or be pretty bad. And there are instances where it's going to be amazing, especially if your opponents have lots of one toughness creatures. The nice thing about this card, though, is that it's also one-sided, right? So you, you won't lose any of your creatures in this exchange. And it also has um, the um, surveil tacked onto it. That being said, I don't know how happy I am playing effects like this unless there's tons of one toughness creatures in the format. So I'm going to start this out at a D that can turn into like a sideboard C, if not better, 
depending on the right matchup. Moving on, Nizumi Linkbreaker. This is black for a 1-1 Rat Warlock. When Nizumi, Life Link, uh, when Nizumi Linkbreaker dies, create a 1-1 red mercenary creature token with tap. Target creature you control gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. Activate only as a sorcery. I like how the creature you get after this dies is better than the creature itself. Um, this card's okay. I mean... It can't be that bad, right? Because this is a one mana body you, that when you trade, uh, you still have another body left over. And there are things to do in this format with effects like this. We saw the one black Saka creature draw two cards. Certainly, this goes really, really well with that card. Additionally, we saw the four mana, three, four menace creature, where if you pay two mana, you can sack a creature to put a plus one, plus one counter on that card as well. So there are homes for this card i just i wouldn't necessarily just look to take this highly and play this in uh in every deck but as far as one mana one ones go i think there's enough synergies in this format where i've always been surprised by how good these cards end up being harried spear guard is a good example in wilds of eldraine where i was like this card can't be good and it'd be pretty solid right and for the same thing i think there's enough things in the sacrifice shell where this can provide you some value so i'm gonna give this a c which goes against what I would normally do when I've seen cards like this in the past. But it's a body that replaces itself and it costs one mana. Next, we have Overzealous Muscle. Four and a black for a 5-4 ogre, uh, ogre Mercenary. Whenever you commit a crime during your turn, Overzealous Muscle gains indestructible until end of turn. I do like the fact that this only triggers on your turn because this card would be a nightmare to attack into. So really, really great knob. So this is absolutely meant for you to play in your, your aggressive decks or decks that are looking to attack because this is really hard to block because you're just, you're just going to be able to likely commit a crime and then your opponent's going to be like, okay. But at the end of the day, on defense, this is a 5-mana five 5-4, five not the most impressive body. I'm going to put this kind of in that filler end of the spectrum. I'm going to give Overzealous Muscle a D. Next up, we have Pitiless Carnage, three and a black, sorcery. Sacrifice any number of permanents you control, then draw that many cards. Plot, one black, black. You may, uh, and so you can, you can set this up so that you plot this kind of late. You don't want to do this turn three, but like turn five or six, you plot. And then on the following turn, you float the mana. And then you cast Pitiless Carnage and you draw like three cards, but you sack three lands. This kind of reminds me of like, what was the other card? Coveted Falcon almost, but I just, I just, this is just too much of a cost to draw cards, in my opinion. Like, I gave that four mana draw three card sorcery a C. If I'm going to give that a C, what am I going to give this card? A D. Maybe an F. This is just not a card that you want to play in your deck, okay? You know what? I change, I change, I change uh, my grade for this. I'm going to give this an F. Don't play Pitiless Carnage in your decks. Next up, Rakish Crew, two and a black, enchantment. When Rakish Crew enters the battlefield, create a one, one red mercenary creature token with tap target creature you control gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn, activate only as a sorcery. Whenever an outlaw you control dies, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. Assassins, mercenaries, pirates, rogues, and warlocks are outlaws. So this is a really interesting card. Because on face value, you're getting a 1-1 for 3 mana. That's pretty bad. But the important thing here is, of course, that drain ability. Um, that's where I think this card can really shine. Because we go back to the um, Nizumi Link Breaker, right? Like, if, if you can find a way to sack the Nizumi Link Breaker for value in a deck that's featuring Rakish Crew and other sacrifice themes... This is a an excellent kind of almost a signpost uncommon for that type of type of uh, deck. This is not something that you just want to play in any deck. Like you definitely want to be kind of able to generate a lot of outlaws so that you and maybe be able to sacrifice them and go back and forth and drain your opponent out and get value in that way. Uh, I'm excited to see if there is a good sacrifice deck because if there is, this is certainly the type of card that you want to play in those those types of decks. So I'm going to give this card like a pseudo build around C 
level type card where um, in certain decks, this card is going to be pretty bad, right? Because it's just a three mana one one. But if you're doing the sacrifice thing, you have a bunch of link breakers and a bunch of ways to sack creatures and and you get some draining going here. I can see this being a very, very annoying card to play against. No, next card, Rattleback Apothecary. Two and a black for a 3-2 Death Touch. Totally fine card, trades with anything. Gorgon Warlock, so it is an outlaw. I wonder what the easiest way, if you don't know what outlaws are, what's the easiest way to tell if something is an outlaw? Is it like is it like the, the cowboy hat thing that they're work, wearing? I don't know. Anyways, when you commit a crime, target creature you control gets your choice of Menace or Lifelink until end of turn. As you can see here, targeting opponents, anything they control, and or cards in their graveyard is a crime. So, what does that mean? Well, like I said, 3 mana, 3-2, three, that touch creature, that's just a totally fine card that you're just going to play, just because it just trades with everything you can trade up. And the fact that there is a very real bonus that you can get out of this is super relevant, right? If you can commit a crime, you give this lifelink, right? You can then trade and then also gain a bunch of life. Or you can give Menace, you can give Evasion to your creatures. I think there's enough going on here that I think I'm going to give this card kind of a low B, right? Like I said, 3 mana, 3-2, three, that touch creature that trades with anything. That's a C-level card, that's fine. But I do like that bonus. Being able to give something Menace or Lifelink, depending on whether... That means this card is good on offense and also on defense, which I really like about this card. So B here for Rattleback, Rattleback Apothecary. Moving on, we have Raven of Fell Omens. One in a black for a 1-2 flyer. Whenever you commit a crime, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. This ability triggers only once each turn. This is a type of card that does make me excited about how easy it is to commit crimes. Because if you get like a couple of these in play, I mean, this thing is also hitting them for one, right? It's an evasive creature. But if you're able to commit a crime like pretty easily, I can see this card potentially overperforming its body because as a two mana one, two, that's a D, right? You just don't really want to play that in your deck. But tack on the fact that you can drain them here, right? I think this is a card that naturally is going to be a D in most instances. If you can commit a crime like once in a game, I don't think that's good enough. But if you can commit a crime pretty frequently, pretty often, that's where I think this can get up, go up to C-level territory. But I don't know that I'm taking this early unless I already know that I'm going to be wanting to commit a lot of crimes. So I'm going to kind of start this out at D. But knowing that it's got the upside to be a C um, if you are committing a lot of crime. Next up, Rictus Robber. Three and a black for a 4-3. When Rictus Robber enters the battlefield, if a creature died this turn, create a 2-2 blue and black zombie creature token. Plot 2 in a black. So this is a 4-3. So if you can find a way to put a creature into the graveyard, it is a 4-3 that puts a 2-2 into play. This card is awesome. And let me tell you why. You it, it's got, First of all, it's got a cheap plot cost, right? If you plot this on three and you play this turn four, even if you don't get a zombie, it's not that bad, right? You spend three mana, you got a four three. Obviously, you don't want to do that. But that's I'm look, I'm talking about the uh, the worst case scenario for a card like this. But what you really want to do is plot this card turn three, turn four. You cast a removal spell, right? You cast a removal spell, kill one of their things, and then you play this for free and you get a two two. Then you're talking about for three mana, you got a 4-3 and a 2-2 two, two onto the battlefield. It is just not hard to be able to, in black especially, to find a way to put this into play and make a 2-2. Two, two. And it's so cheap. It's so cheap. This is a B. I love, I love Rictus Robber. We'll note that this does not work with the premium black exile removal spell. That is a nonbo because that exiles. But in other instances, you're just it's just not going to be hard to set this up. And I think this card is excellent. Next up, we have Rooftop Assassin. Three and a black for a 2-2 two, two flash flying lifelinker. When Rooftop Assassin enters the battlefield, destroy target creature in opponent controls that was dealt damage this turn. Wow. Okay, so... 
We've had effects like this in the past, and they were all kind of mediocre. I think there was even one, it was like a 4-mana 3-1 flying flash creature that had the exact same line of text. But this is different, because it's got lifelink, right? It's a 4-mana 2-2 flying flash lifelink. That's, that's almost good enough. That is almost good enough. Just because it's really hard to block this creature, right? It's got evasion. It's really hard to race. It's giving you that lifelink. But on top of that, every now and then, you can also use this to kill something as well in combat. So I think effects like this in the past, without the lifelink, I think this would be probably a D-level card, maybe a low C. But given the fact that this has lifelink, I'm going to put this at C. I don't think you want like infinite copies of Rooftop Assassin, like... You still need to be careful, and a savvy opponent will also be mindful of the card that this card exists, so it'll be harder to blow people out sometimes with this card. But like I said, if your opponent's just like, go, okay, I'm not going to play around it. Like, you pass, I'm just not going to do something. Like, you can still just play this. It's not that bad. You just play this. Like, if, even if they don't attack you, you're just like, all right, fine, whatever. I play this, I have a 2-2 flying lifelinker in play. And that's still just a, an okay creature to have. And that's the floor of this card, so... Ruth C for Rooftop Assassin. Moving on, we have a rare, Rush of Dread. Okay, this one, it's going to take a little bit of time to process, okay? One black, black sorcery. It's got spree on it. Plus one. Target opponent sacrifices half the creatures they control, rounded up. Now, that's very important, rounded up. If they have three creatures, they sack two of them. That is really, really important, okay? Next up, plus two. Target opponent discards half the cards in their hand. Round it up. Probably going to use that one a little bit less, right? You're going to use that a little bit less. Next, plus two. Target opponent loses half their life. Round it up. So, I mean, there are instances where you can use this for five mana and deal 10 damage to your opponent, right? If they're at, ten, if they're at max life. But I, the place that you really want to start with this is that first mode. That first mode is super important. So for two colorless and two black, your opponents have to sacrifice two creatures they, uh, creatures they control rounded up. Now, if you're only getting one card with this, it's not good, right? Edicts generally are not ideal. But if you can get two things, even if there are two worst creatures, you're still getting a lot of value out of that. It's still a two for one, right? It's still a two for one. Like imagine a board, like I said, and it works when they have three creatures. So if you play this like turn five, by then, they should probably have three creatures in play. You play this, they sack two of their things. That's incredible, right? But the, but the thing is, this also scales, right? This scales really well. The longer the game goes, what if you have a stalemate? They got to sack half their board, right? They got to, you know, if they have five creatures, they have to sack three things. So that by itself, I think, is a card that's worthy to put in your deck. On top of that, you have all the extra abilities, the discard effect is probably the weakest. It's fine. And the burn effect sometimes can be okay. But I'm just saying those cards add to what already is a pretty solid card, right? If you pay six mana, if it's like six mana, your opponents lose half their creatures and half their life. Yeah. Okay. I'll do it. So I'm going to be a little bit conservative here. But I'm going to say this is a B. But I would not be shocked after playing with it more depending on the speed of the format, to find out if this card ends up being even better than that. But I think this card looks really sweet. I want to take it, and I want to play with it. And I want, to, I want to pay 8 mana and do all the things. I want to pay 8 mana and do all the things. Next up, Servant of the Stinger. One in a black for a 1-3 death touch creature. Sign me up. Whenever Servant of the Stinger deals combat damage to a player... If you committed a crime this turn, you may sacrifice Servant of the Stinger. If you do, search your library for a card, put it into your hand, then shuffle. So, a 2-mana 1-3 Death Touch creature I am playing all day, every day. It trades up, it, and the thing is, the fact that it has 3 toughness means like it just blocks everything early, and it literally it just gobbles them up, right? And I mean, even look at like the three mana two fours that exist. This just eats all of them up, right? So it's an excellent creature to have in the early game. And then in the late game, it's pretty hard to block. And if this actually connects and you commit a crime and you have a good card in your deck, it's just demonic tutor. Yeah, this card is great. Gives you good value, good body. 
I'm going to give Servant of the Stinger a solid B. Moving on, we have Shoot the Sheriff. One in a black for an instant, destroy target, non-outlaw creature. Assassins, mercenaries, pirates, rogues, and warlocks are outlaws. Everyone else is fair game. I do, I love, I love that extra little line just for fun. Uh, I Obviously, I haven't played the format, so I don't know exactly how many outlaws and non-outlaws they're going to be. But if this is going to kill 60% of the creatures at two mana at instant speed, I'm still happy with that. I think this card is still going to be good. Unless absolutely everything is an outlaw. Like, I can't imagine this card being bad. I imagine Shoot the Sheriff is going to be another great removal spell, and I'm going to give this a B. Next up, Skullduggery, an oldie but a goodie. Black Instant. Until end of turn, target creature you control gets plus one, plus one, and target creature in opponent controls gets minus one, minus one. Now, this effect was already an overperforming combat trick. I remember when this first came out in Ixalan, it, like I was like, oh, is this card any good? And then I played with it. I'm like, oh, wow. This, this can get really, really swingy. This card can get really, really swingy. But on top of that, especially in this format, it's even better. Because it's another really cheap way to A, commit a crime, and B, it's another cheap spell to let you cast multiple spells in a turn. We looked at that Gissa card, right? You play Gissa into Skullduggery, boom. Two three threes right onto the battlefield. There's lots of uh, one one. There's a lot of cards that generate random one one tokens. So I feel like you're just going to have a decent number of targets for this card, anyways. So I think this card is just going to be kind of the premier quote unquote combat trick. This is probably Black's best combat trick slash way to commit a crime slash removal spell for small things. I do like Skullduggery a pretty good amount. I'm I'm actually after talking about it more. I'm thinking about even moving it up even higher on my list of comments, but uh, definitely like this card. Now, you can have a situation where you have too many of this card because you don't want too many of these cards because they don't really kill really kills small things, but the first one is always a welcome addition and I'm happy to play even potentially up to two copies depending on how much crime you are committing. C for Skullduggery. Next up, we have a Legendary Enchantment. Tiny, bo Tiny Bones joins up. One black, legendary enchantment. When Tiny Bones joins up, enters the battlefield. Any number of target players each discard a card. Whenever a legendary creature enters the battlefield under your control, any number of target players each mill a card and lose one life. So, it's a one black legendary enchantment that makes your opponent discard a card. So... Not great. Whenever a legendary creature enters a battlefield under you, I don't think that there's many legendary creatures in this format, so I don't think that happens that often. And even when you do, the effect that you get is not very strong. All it allows you to do is basically commit a crime. You can target an opponent when you do that. And the first ability also lets you commit a crime. So if you really need a way to you can just do so much better than this. I just would never want to play one black ETB discard a card. Now, you're going to be like, hey, Paul, remember Hopeless Nightmare? How good was that card? It's a big difference, right? Hopeless Nightmare dealt two damage, enabled ways to uh, get value. It enabled you to bargain your spells. This card is way, way different than something like that. And that other card also scryed for two. So this card is... 10 times worse than the other one. Tiny Bones joins up. I'm just going to give this an F. Don't put this in your deck. It looks exciting. You're like, oh, it's cheap, right? Oh, I get to commit a crime. You're making them discard a card. There's nothing else really to this card. Really don't play this card. However, Tiny Bones themselves. One black, one one, legendary creature, skeleton rogue with death touch. Look, you're always going to play one mana, one one death touch in most of your decks. When Tiny Bones, the pickpocket, deals combat damage to a player... You may cast target non-land permanent card from that player's graveyard and mana of any type can be spent to cast that spell. Wait, so a one mana one one card that if it ever connects, you get to cast a card for free? Sign me up. Sign me up. That's, that's something that I'm just excited to have. Now, the question is, how often are you, are you actually going to connect with Tiny Bones? A one mana one one death touch creature is nice because it acts as a very good defensive creature. But of course, it's a pretty terrible offensive creature. You know, every now and then you're going to be able to eat like a 2-2, but oftentimes they're going to have like a 1-1 token in play. So I would look at this primarily as a way to just 
put in your deck as a defensive creature. If you somehow hand away, have a way to give this evasion, that would be awesome. I just don't think that there's too many ways to do that. If you have a deck with a million removal spells and this somehow connects, or your opponent's really careless, I can see you getting some value out of it. But all in all, I think the most often, t- like the, the most common thing that you'll have with this card is that it is a one mana, one, one death touch creature. And I think that's just kind of a, a low C level card that you can play in your deck. Next up, we have Treasure Dredger. One and a black for a 2 2. One tap, pay one life, create a treasure token. It's a bear that can slowly ramp you, right? It's like if this was a two mana 2 2 that like, tapped pay one life out of mana of any color it would be like a high c this is just a c i guess it does help you fix because it creates treasure it's not that special though so i'm gonna give treasure dredger just a c next we have unfortunate accident one black instant plus two colorless and a black so for two colorless and two black destroy target creature all right that's fine c level card Plus one, create a 1-1 one, one red mercenary creature token with target tap, target creature you control gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn, activate only as a sorcery. So that is a big deal. So obviously you're you're almost never going to cast this as two mana, make a instant speed 1-1. One, one. But what you're going to do a lot here is wait to cast this on turn five, if you can help it. If you can help it, and you're looking at a uh, five mana one one instant speed, it's a five. So think about it this way: five mana instant speed, make a one one a kill a creature. How good is that card? I think it's pretty solid. And additionally, you can also play this at four mana destroy target creature. So you have that flexibility. If you absolutely have to kill something on four. Go for it. But if you want that extra value and you want that token for your sacrifice deck and you can hold them off, then you can play it for five mana and you get that extra little value. So I think like just the removal spell by itself is kind of in that C range. The fact that you get a little more flexibility with that spree kind of puts it into the the low B range for me for unfortunate accident. Next, we have Unscrupulous Contractor. Two and a black for a three, two. When Unscrupulous Contractor enters a battlefield, you may sacrifice a creature. When you do, target player draws two cards and loses two life. It's kind of interesting that a lot of these draw effects have target tacked onto them. So you do have to be careful when you're playing against these black decks because just don't get down to like three or four life because they're going to have a lot of reach, right? They might use some of these creatures to just burn you out. So that's just something to keep in your brain. Like... If you, when you think of black, you don't think of black as like the burn color, but there's a few ways to actually target players and have them lose life and de- take damage. So just be mindful of that. Now, how good is this card? Well, three mana for three, two body is fairly weak. I think this is a card that again is a nice card to have if you are looking to do the sacrifice thing. But if even if you do the sacrifice thing, like you draw two cards and you pay... So this, again, pairs well with the one mana 1-1. One, one. When it dies, it makes a 1-1 one, one because then you can play this and then draw two cards and lose two life. Um, that being said, I don't think this is anything that special. Um, I'm going to give this card a C. It's fine. But I, I, like, I'm not overly excited about, about a card like the uh, Unscrupulous Contractor. I would actually kind of prefer if this had a more defensively slanted body just because... Uh, this is causing you to sack a creature. So presumably you want to put this in a deck that's a little slower, right? That's trying to make the game go long. So if this was like a 1-4, I think it would probably be more desirable. All right, moving on. Vadmir, New Blood. I mean, Legendary Vampire, this card better be awesome. Two mana for a 2-2. Whenever you commit a crime, put a plus one, plus one counter on Vadmir, New Blood. This ability triggers only once each turn. Remember, you can target it, you can trigger it on your turn and also your opponent's turn. This is the souped up version of that uncommon we saw, which was a two mana one one, by the way. As long as Vadmir has four or more counters on it, it has menace and lifelink. This is a nice card. This is a nice card. Again, it just depends on how easy it is for you to commit crimes. If you can commit crimes and it's fairly trivial, this can potentially get out of hand. 
it's such a big difference that this starts out as a 2-2, whereas the other uncommon starts out as a 1-1. And the fact that the payoff for this, if you can... Sub- I mean, I feel like... I know committing crime is going to be a thing. Committing four crimes still seems like a lot. I don't really know if that happens that often. Um, but if you do, obviously, this thing just gets a little bit out of hand. Um how good is this card? I'm going to say, I don't want to quite put this quite on the A territory just yet. Um, I'm happy to be proven wrong, but I will say Vadmir is likely a B plus. This is a high B. I like this card. It's going to make me want to commit lots and lots of crimes. And then in the late game, this becomes just this giant menacing beater. I was, I was actually kind of hoping that this would fly because it's a vampire. That would make this like way more awesome. It would probably, for me, jump it up to A minus territory. But given that it has Menace, not quite as strong. Still very good. Still very good. Still happy to first pick this card, of course. Next, we have Vault Plunderer. Two and a black for a 3-1 Human Rogue. When Vault Plunderer enters the battlefield, target player draws a card and loses one life. Another way to ping your opponents, which is a thing that you can do. But for the most part, this is a 3-mana three 3-1 three that replaces itself. It's a little bit worse because in this format, there's a lot of things that make 1-1s, right? But it's a pretty good blocker, and if they don't make tokens, well, it's a decent attacker as well. It replaces itself. I've always been a sucker for cards like this. You know, we call them Phyrexian Rager effects. That's like the the original. It was like a 3-mana 2-2 ETB draw card. I think a 2-2 would be more valuable in this format than a 3-1. But it's still fine. This is totally a C. I can't imagine really cutting... Vault Plunder in my black decks, right? Like, how many Vault Plunders before you actually end up cutting this card in your deck? This is still probably going to be one of the better black commons in the set, just because it's a three mana, it's a three mana creature that replaces itself, right? We talked about Lone Shark, which is a four mana three four. You go through some hoops. Sometimes you can draw a card. This is just straight up turn three. You play this, and it replaces itself, and you draw a card. So a card that, um, at least when you talk to a lot of the old school players, they're going to like this card a lot. Moving on, we have, ooh, the first vault card, or excuse me, um, big score card, Greed's Gambit. And this one is going to be a card that a lot of people are going to talk about because it's very, very hard to evaluate, okay? It's three and a black for an enchantment. When Greed's Gambit enters the battlefield, you draw three cards, gain six life, create three, two, one black bat creature tokens with flying. That's it. Yeah, that card will be totally broken. That card will be totally broken and it would cost six mana. At the beginning of your end step, you discard a card, lose two life, and sacrifice a creature. When Greed's Gambit leaves the battlefield, you discard three cards, lose six life, and sacrifice three creatures. Man, I really, really wish that last line of text didn't exist. But I do think flavor-wise... It's amazing because obviously it's literally called Greed's Gambit, right? So like this is a card that for you greedy players, this is perfect because you like to think you're a half full kind of person. If you're the glass is half full kind of person, you're like, oh man, I'm going to play this, right? I'm going to play, it's going to be the last card in my hand. I'm going to get six, three, six power of flyer on the battlefield. I'm going to gain all this life. And then I'm going to sack my like dirty 1-1 token and it's going to be fine. And I'm going to kill them really, really quickly. So that's the ceiling for that card, right? This is certainly not a card that you play on turn four. It's a card you play as kind of the last card in your hand. And that's where I think you can get the most benefit out of this. Primarily from the 3-2-1 flying bat tokens that come into play because you want to finish the game quick. You don't want to play this card generally if you don't have any other creatures in play because it makes you sacrifice a creature every single turn. Like, you have to kill them quickly, or you will lose to this card, right? So the idea behind this card is you play this when you have nothing else to play, right? Then you draw your cards or whatever. You're going to discard one of them, but you have, you've gained some life. You're going to go immediately back down to four, right? You're going to lose a creature, but then you have the three, two, one bats. And ideally, what you want is to have those bats try to end the game as quickly as possible. And with that drawback, every turn, you have to discard a card, which... 
Might not be that big of a deal because if you cast this as the last card in your hand, outside of that first card you discard, presumably you'll just be able to continue playing your entire hand every turn. You'll be hellbent. So that mode is not too bad of a drawback. But you're going to be losing two life every turn and discarding creatures, uh, sacrificing creatures every turn. Additionally, the super ultra giga terrible thing that can happen is if your opponent finds a way to kill this. I believe there's a green comment that's just disenchants. It's like on a 2-2 body. If that's the case, do you really want to play this? Right? Can you imagine playing this and like, oh, check out all the things I did. And your opponent's like, 2-2, two, two, sack, kill your Greed's Gambit. You lose the game. Right? So the floor is literally the center of the earth. Right? It is deep down a volcano. There is no escape. You are dead. But the ceiling is reasonably high. Right, you can. I can see lots of people winning with this card, but I can also see lots of people losing with this card. So we have to figure out, on average, where is this card going to land? And I'm going to be really honest with you. I don't know. I see the floor, and it's just F tier. You know, the ceiling I see as like a B level card potentially, if those bats can kind of carry the distance. And, and go a long way. But I just see a lot of instances too where like, let's say you have this card and your opponent has like a 4-4 a four, four flyer. Right? If the games are going to go kind of long, like ultimately you're just going to lose all your creatures again. Right? So it's weird. I just think feel like all the stars have to align for this card to be good. And if it does, great. You can win some games with this. But in general, I don't think I want this card. So where does that put this? I'm definitely going to take this card and find out. I'll start with by saying that. I'm going to say... I'm going to give this card a C. An optimistic C. I hope that this card somehow ends up being awesome. That I just haven't properly processed what it actually means to get all these advantages right away. And if that can actually snowball the game. Or if the drawback is just too great and if the format slows is a little slow, then maybe this is not good enough. I'm not sure where I'm at right now. So I'm just going to put this at a C. C for will C. Next up, a more obviously powerful card. Harvester of Misery. Three black black for a 5-4 menace. When Harvester of Misery enters the battlefield, other creatures get minus two, minus two until end of turn. One in a black. Discard Harvester of Misery. Target creature gets minus two, minus two until end of turn. This card is very good. Great in the early game. You can use this as a way to kill something. Ideally, you want to be able to just hard cast this card to wipe the board and you still have a 5-4 in play. But of course, it just gives you that safety valve. In case your opponent does play Vadmir on turn two, you're going to want to just discard Harvester of Misery. So uh, I think this card is just awesome. I'm going to give this card probably like a low A. There are instances where that minus two, minus two ability is amazing. There are instances where it's not ideal, but the fact that you can still use this early to kill something and it still comes attached to a five mana, five, four menace. I feel like there's just enough upside to this card that I'm going to give this a low A. Next up, Hostile Investigator. Three and a black, four, four, three. When Hostile Investigator enters a battlefield, target opponent discards a card. Whenever one or more players discards one or more cards, investigate. This ability triggers only once each turn. So, bare minimum, with the help of no other cards, when this comes into play, you target your opponent, they discard a card, and you get a clue. That's just good value, right? We loved, us, we, we loved ourselves a Loxodon... Uh, how did I forget the, the, the name? Eavesdropper, right? That was a 4-mana 3-3 three, three that ETBs... And makes a clue. This is a 4-mana four 4-3 four, that gets you a clue. And they lose a card. And you get to commit a crime. And there might be instances where you have other ways to make them discard a card. Let's say you have that haunting 4-2 flyer. And you play that card after you play this thing. Then you get another clue? I'm in for that. It's a lot of value. Now, I don't think... I mean, this doesn't have like that... This gives you value, but it doesn't catch you up in the way that a lot of other cards can. Like the sweeper and what have you. But this is a solid B. I like Hostile Investigator. I'm going to take it highly. It's it's guaranteed two for one with a, that comes on a solid body. No, excuse me. This is a three for one. I, I You know, I, I haven't seen it. Like, 
I mean, this is like a like a mold drifter <laughs> on a four three body for four mana. This card's great. Yeah, definitely a B. Probably a high B to be honest. All right, next we have the bonus sheet cards here. Starting things off with Heartless Pillage. These cards are cards that um, you will see pretty rarely, um, and they're not standard legal, but they're cards to add a little bit of spice to, uh, to the limited environment. Heartless Pillage, two and a black sorcery. Target opponent discards two cards. Combo. Okay, anyways. Um, mind rots are just not great. Raid, if you attack this turn, create a treasure token. Still not good enough. Heartless Pillage is a D for me. I'm just not a big fan of mind rots in uh, the modern limited environment where formats are much more tempo-oriented. You just simply can't take the time to uh, play a card like this. I will say, though, that in sealed deck, things are slower. People don't have ideal curves. These effects do get a little bit better. Next up, Imp's Mischief. One and a black. Instant. Change the target of target spell with a single target. You lose life equal to that spell's mana value. So you can misdirect the spell. It's kind of cute. I remember this was a card that you can draft in Time Spiral, and I rarely played it then as well. I don't think this card is especially good. It's highly situational. I'm going to give this card a D as well. Next up, we have an oldie. A newie? Anyways, this card's always been around. You saw Murder in the last set. I will say Murder is definitely much better in this set than it was in the last one. One black, black, instant, destroy target creature. Very, very clean. I'm going to give this card a B. Probably a low B, but do like it. It's just a clean removal spell. Kills anything that you want. There's less things that go wide. Or actually, I don't know if there's less things that go wide in this format. But again, not every creature in the format has Ward 2. So this has lots of opportunity to uh, trade up on mana. Just a solid removal spell. Next up. Ooh, this one is an exciting one. Overwhelming Forces. Six black black sorcery. Destroy all creatures target opponent controls. Draw a card for each creature destroyed this way. Now, this costs eight mana. That's a big cost, but the ability is awesome, right? This is a one-sided sweeper that also makes it so that you just don't run out of gas, right? You play this card. If you play this card on just a remotely even board, it's just over, right? You're going to draw like five cards and they're going to have no board and that's it. That's that, right? The, the thing is though, you have to build around this card. You have to play maybe 18 lands, perhaps some ramp spells or card draw effects to be able to get to the point where you can cast this card. So this is certainly a card that you have to draft around. You just can't put this in like a 17 land deck that like doesn't have card draw and just is looking to curve out. It just doesn't work. But if you can draft the right deck around this, I think this card can be a B. Maybe an A if you have like lots and lots of ramp, but it costs eight mana. Eight mana is a lot, but it is backbreaking. It's, it's kind of like Doppelgang to be fair. Right? It's kind of like Doppelgang, except um, Doppelgang at least had the safety valve of being able to play for five. You don't get where and you get some value out of it. Whereas with this card, you just don't have that as an option. Next up, reanimate. Put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under your control. You lose life equal to its mana value. Well, if you reanimate something big, I just feel like you just take a little too much value. And I'm not sure that there's too many easy ways to put a big thing into play. It would have been pretty cool in uh, Murders at Karlov Manor. You're like, cycle away a Topiary Panther and put it into play on turn three. That would be kind of cool. I just don't think that there's too many ways to do that in this format. So I just don't think Reanimate's going to be that great. I think losing life is just too big of a cost for the most part. Um, so I'm going to give this card a D. Well, speaking of a card that's even worse than that, Surgical Extraction. Choose target card in a graveyard other than a basic land card. Search its owner's library, graveyard, hand, and library for any number of cards with the same name as that card and exile them. Then that player shuffles. This costs a black. It's an instant. You can also pay it for Phyrexian mana, which means you can pay two life instead to cast this card. So it's a free spell. But it doesn't do anything. That's the problem. It doesn't do anything. This is a... What's the opposite of a slam dunk? An air ball? Yeah. 
So like like when I say it's like a slam dunk first pick, this is like an air ball F. Don't take surgical extraction. Again, unless you like the art and you want to keep the card. All right. Last card. Thoughtseize. They did bring back some nice iconic cards here. Black, sorcery. Target player reveals their hand. You choose a non-land card from it. That player discards that card. You lose two life. Now, you know how I feel about hand disruption cards um, in this format in general. You know, I wasn't very high on the two mana one. I'm not going to be super high on this one as well. We'll note that the uh, the difference though is at least with Thoughtseize, you do take two damage, but it is nice that you can play this turn one. The problem with the two mana hand disruption spell is when you play it on turn two, you have to make the decision of playing that over a two mana creature. Whereas turn one, you usually don't have anything to do. So to be able to curve out and go turn one Thoughtseize into turn two creature is pretty relevant. So where do I put this card? I know it's an iconic card. It's one of the best cards of all time in Constructed. But for Limited specifically, this is a C. It's probably like a low C. You don't need to take a card like Thoughtseize very, very highly. And that'll do it. That'll do it here for Black Commons. Quickly going to go over the top five Black Commons here and uh, see what I have here on my list. Coming in at number five, we have Skull Duggery. Now, this is definitely a card that I can see go up in the rankings depending on how important it is to uh, commit crimes. But I just really think this is a great combat trick. It was good in the past and I don't see why it wouldn't be good now. It's a cheap way to commit a crime. There's a lot of different ways to make one ones in this format. So I think you'll be able to get your value here. So I do like this card. Like I said, I can certainly see this moving up in the ranks. Coming in at number four, we have Desert's Dew. This is just kind of a solid-ish removal spell. I think this is the card that definitely can go up and down this list, depending on how many deserts you end up in your deck. If you somehow have this weird deck with like five or six deserts, and you're often being able to go minus three, minus three, or minus four, minus four, then this becomes potentially even the best black common in your deck if you can manage to find that many deserts. But I'm playing, I'm just going under the assumption that you're going to have like one desert or two. And I feel like in most instances, this is probably going to be a minus two, minus two effect. And like 80% of the time and maybe 20% of the time you can get something bigger. Coming in at number three, we have Vault Plunderer. So this one, I don't know. I mean, I just really like this creature. I think this card just gives you a lot of value. So I'm playing it here, uh, putting it here at number three. Um... The fact that it replaces itself, I really, really like. And so I'm, I'm happy just testing the limits to of how many Vault Plunderers I can put into my deck before it just ends up not being good. Or if the format just has way too many ways to make 1-1s, one where just an X1 is just not something that you want to do, I can definitely see that being the case. But for now, I am pretty high on the Vault Plunderer. Moving on, though. I have a card that doesn't give you value because I've also grown up a little bit here. Desperate Bloodseeker, I have as the number two common. Uh, it's a bear, but it's got lifelink, and it just, I feel like it just kind of does everything that you want, right? We looked at all the black cards. There's a lot of things that kind of would like for you to have. You, there's a lot of ways that you would like to fill up your graveyard in some way, right? There's the Gravedigger card. There's cards that care about creatures in your graveyard. So I just feel like there's enough there where milling, your, milling yourself for two is actively good. Additionally, Milling your opponents for two can also be something that you want to commit a crime. So that uh, kind of added onto the fact that this is just a two mana creature that I'm always going to be happy playing is the reason why I have this card so high. Look at Murders at Karlov Mana, right? Uh, Murla's, Murders at Karlov Manor. It's a lot of talking. Uh, repeat Offender. Unscrupulous Agent. I mean, Repeat Offender was just like... Th that's kind of the two drops we were at before. It's a two mana, two one that I have to pay three mana to give it suspect. That was just like too much. That was too bad. Now we're looking at a two mana, two two lifelinker with a very relevant ability that I think is actively going to be good no matter which person you target with this card. So I'm going to have this app at number two. If the format's really slow and maybe you don't need that many bears, maybe I can see this moving down. But for now, I'm going to have it up here. And for my number one card, I'm going to have... Consuming Ashes here, and again, I'm willing to, I think I could I could be wrong about this as well, 
because it's a four mana instant speed removal. But uh, this format doesn't necessarily seem as fast as some of the others. I think the exile clause is super relevant uh, to fight against a lot of the combat tricks people can have. It does counter a common black combat trick and also counters a common white combat trick that ha traditionally has been used to counter removal effects like this. But now this kind of prevents that from happening. And I do think that the surveil two that's also tacked onto this when you kill small creatures is not irrelevant, right? When you're spending four mana to kill a four drop, that's fine. Or anything bigger, then it's great, right? At instant speed. But if you're also killing something small and being able to surveil too, that also has value because surveilling things is very relevant in this format too, just because putting things into your graveyard can have some payoffs later in the game. So this is my list for now, subject to change, of course, after next week. But that does it here for the limited set review for Outlaws of Thunder Junction for black. We have red, green, and gold cards and un uh, colorless cards coming up well as well on top of that. If you've enjoyed this content and wanted to support the channel, I did launch a Patreon channel. Shout out to all the current patrons. Thank you so much for the support. We do have a Discord channel where we are actively discussing all things limited uh, and even constructed. We have an arena championship thing that I'm also going to play next week as well. But um, yeah, the Discord's been really popping off and... Uh, really hope to build a really big, com uh, great community there. And the best way to do that, of course, is to join the Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. Lot to, lot to digest, but hopefully this at least gave you the foundation to how to evaluate your cards as we move into, of course, the pre-release and uh, drafts moving forward. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you with the red cards tomorrow.